melting ice, rising seas, and shifting shorelines. And that pretty well encompasses the scope of what I want to talk to you about. And once I've kind of gone through the science and taken you on some visual first-hand encounters in, in, the, in both polar regions, I want to talk to you about our future, what it means, and then suggest to you some of our options. I can probably tell you some things about the state of the planet, particularly the ice sheets as they're melting and what it means, because that's been the focus of my research on and off for the last three or four decades. Hurricane Sandy focused a lot of people about the potential destruction of storms and tides. This was in Fort Lauderdale, near where I happen to live. That's actually a street under that water, so it's a perfect example of a high tide on Main Street. We all saw, saw images from New Jersey, houses being wiped clean off their foundations, cars floating out of tunnels in New York, subways that became submarine. And just two days after Sandy hit, I was interviewed on British television, live for a morning show, 7.30 over there, 3.30 for me in Florida. And the, uh, the host there, Eamon Holmes, said, so Mr. Englander, I have your book in front of me, and on page 121, you describe a superstorm hitting Atlantic City and New York City. How did you do that a week before it happened? <laughs> Fair question, and if it hadn't been 3.30, I probably would have found a clever way to answer, but I said, the truth is I didn't predict it. I described one of many scenarios of what could happen to help people visualize just how bad the damage could be, far beyond what most of us ever think about. The fact that it happened a week after the book hit, uh, was available on Amazon is uh, surprising to me too, frankly. But it does give a good backdrop to explain not only what happened at San during Sandy, but what will happen in the future. And I've put together a simple little bar chart here. I'm going to give you three or four examples of it. Sandy was a storm surge of about six feet by itself, amplified by a few things. And it came on top of a foot of sea level rise that had occurred over the previous century in New York. And then on top of that, there was an unusual high tide, a lunar high tide, plus a little bit. Not a full extreme tide. As you may know, tides vary during the day, almost twice a day. And then there's a monthly lunar high tide. And then when the planets line up, there's even an extreme tide. We had a, a moderately unusual tide. And then on top of that, in, shown in green here, is what I call topographic amplification. And there's certain places where the water is funneled. And between Long Island and New York or New Jersey is one such case, which was the reason I gave that example. Boston would be another case if the storm came from the, north, the northeast. There are lots of providences particularly vulnerable. So there are lots of places that have amplification because of the geography or topography. That gets us to nine and a half feet over the foot of sea level rise that's happened in the past century. If we move forward and look toward the end of the century with some of the scenarios of two, four, or six feet of sea level rise that most scientists believe are, are a fair range, we see what that would do, of course. The base level of sea level rise would be up higher, and the interesting thing is that that solid area shown, the sea level rise doesn't recede. It won't recede for centuries or probably thousands of years because the ice sheets can't refreeze that quickly, as we'll look at in a moment. But it's important to distinguish sea level rise from storm surge, the shade areas. But then on top of that, there's a potential for sea level rise to actually be beyond the projections that scientists are currently looking at. And I'll talk about that. There's a few factors in Western Antarctic and with methane that are actually outside the sea level rise projections that you read. And that's something that's a particular concern to me because I don't think we're looking at, I don't want to say the worst case, we shouldn't look at the very worst case, but I, don't, I think most of the situations we're looking at with sea level rise are skewed to the low side, and I'll, I think, prove that to you in a moment. But if we, if we put in that block of red to show the extra sea level rise that could happen from methane and, uh, in Western Antarctic, and then put those other blocks on top of there with a little more tide rise, we start seeing that we, we really have a much bigger problem. And then if we take one of the higher projections for sea level rise that you'll see the six foot, and we add on the, the acceleration for methane in Western Antarctic in red, and you can see these all stack up. Well, there's two points here. One is that all these things do add up, as Sandy illustrated. But the other one that very few people think about is that sea level rise doesn't recede. It, sea level change happens over thousands of years. 
So some of this is a one-way event, and some of it's a, the tide comes in and it goes out, or the storm comes in and goes out. Now, a lot of what I'm about to tell you, you probably know parts of, but seeing it can be um, daunting, it can be overpowering, it can be depressing sometimes. And uh, by the time I'm done, if you don't leave the theater in, uh, in, in uh, dismay during the talk, if you bear with me to the end, I'm going to share with you some perspectives that I hope help, that I've come to perhaps as rationale, but I, they're sincere, as I consider what does it mean for me and for my 12-year-old daughter looking ahead. And I'd like to share that with you. So as you see this as a, a really challenging problem, please, uh, please bear with me and think it through to the end. Again, just a simple illustration that if we look at the shoreline, kind of just in a diagram, we have high, the sea level is the base, then there's high tide, and then there's storm surge, and then if storm surge hits at high tide, each of them raises the level and means that the water's gonna come further inland, obvious. I'm control my clicker. When we go to the beach, there's a bit of an illusion. The illusion is that the beach is permanent, that it's always been there and always will be. I have that sense too. But the reality is the shoreline's only been there for about 6,000 years. The reason we think that's permanent is that's kind of how long we go back in our human records, our written records. And most people would say that human civilization doesn't go back much more than six or 8,000 years. But the shoreline is only there, the Green Arrow, as long as sea level's there. And it's not always been there. This one shows the sea level over the last century rose eight inches. And uh, two things out of this slide, that it rose seven or eight inches as a global average. We're gonna look at it broken down by different locations in a moment. But while there are little bumps in the line, it's pretty easy to see that from 1850 to 2010, the line is pretty consistently upward. Unfortunately, a lot of scientists and a lot of people who want to throw doubt into this issue look at the little bumps up and down in the line. And I say it's a bit like looking at a stock market chart or the price of gold or any other thing that warbles, but you kind of want to look at the long term. If you could buy a stock that was doing this for 150 years, you'd probably be glad to buy it. You wouldn't care that it went down last week. And sea level rises just on a steady march upward, and it's been that way for over 150 years. Here's the differentiation from different, the same period of time since 1880, sea level rise differentiated by cities from New Orleans on the left where it rose 46 inches to New York in about the middle where it rose 14 inches to on the far right Los Angeles where it only rose four inches. Now I know you would think that sea level if we pull out the waves and the tides would be consistent around the world, it's not. For several reasons. One of the most prominent is that land masses move up and down by fractions of an inch a year but that adds up land uplift or subsidence. And just to put that in perspective, New Orleans and Virginia are sinking quicker than most areas, so sea level rise is faster there in relation to the land. Alaska, the land is uplifting, rising, faster than anywhere else in the United States. So in Alaska, when they look at sea level, sea level's dropping because the land is rising faster than the water. So again, it's a surprising fact, and there are some other considerations about temperature of the water and currents, but that's the, probably the biggest one. So when people doubt sea level rise or see something different than the eight inch average, that's why. Now the reason that sea level rose a lot has to do with the ice age. And if you have young kids or grandkids, you may have watched this movie as many times as I did. This is ice age part two, the meltdown. And behind the, uh, furry animals is two miles of ice. And what it does is just give us a good visual reminder that we know the ice age happened. It actually happened quite repeatedly, and we'll look at that in a moment. But two miles of ice, which is roughly 10,000 feet of ice, when it melts, it raises the ocean level about 400 feet. If we look back in a geologic chart to the last ice age, and a lot of people say, well, I know sea levels change, but they probably don't know how long 
The last ice age maximum was 20,000 years ago. And sea level was down 390 feet below where it is today. It's an astounding amount. And it rose, not smoothly, a little bit of bumps, but then 14,000 years ago, it rose in a sudden step, you can see there in the middle. It rose 65 feet in four centuries. That's a foot and a half a decade for 40 decades. Hard to imagine. And that's by nature, that's no impact of man. So it can happen even, even in nature, but it got to the present level about six or 8,000 years ago. But it's pretty extraordinary because in our day-to-day -day existence, when we go to the beach, we'd never think it could move that, that much. But again, our human experience, a year's a while, 10 years seems like forever. Of course, a generation is 20, 30 years, and a lifetime is more like you know, 80 or 90 or 100. And that's about as far back as we go. And even if we look back to perhaps even biblical times, a couple of thousand years ago, that's forever. But it's not geologic time. If we step back one more step to get a big picture and see what is that pattern that people say, well, that's a natural pattern here. This climate change must be part of a natural pattern. Well, when people question me about that, I say, well, let's, let's look at that because I'm glad you, you know there's a natural pattern. In fact, there is a pattern of ice ages. We've had an ice age for pretty much the last five million years, about every 100,000 years. And that top graph shows almost a million years, 900,000. And it shows the pattern of the ocean in blue going up and down. And then in the lower part, kind of does a blow up of the last ice age cycle, the most recent 140,000 years. What's particularly noticeable here is two things. One, that the pattern of peaks of the ocean going up and down three or 400 feet is pretty regular. It happens between 95 and 125,000 years. So call it 100,000, just to keep it simple. But more interestingly, the ocean dropping and rising that three or 400 feet doesn't happen evenly. It goes down for about 80,000 years and it rises for about 20,000 years. The truth is, until I did the research for this book, I never quite grasped that 2080 split. But it's really important because 20,000 years ago, the ocean was down almost 400 feet. And if you look at the pattern, we're at the top part of the pattern. We should be at the time, not this week or this month or this year necessarily, but this era, we should be at the time when we're rounding the corner at the warmest point, when the ice sheets are at their minimum and sea level's at its maximum, right? Temperature melts ice, which raises the ocean level and beginning the 80,000 year decline toward the next ice age. But we're not gonna have that problem anymore. We've kind of solved the problem of the ice ages. We're not gonna be entering the next ice age because we're warming. And this puts it in perspective that we've actually changed the natural cycle. I used to say we've accelerated climate change. We haven't accelerated climate change. This makes pretty clear that we have changed the direction. We've actually interrupted the cycle in the last five million years, which I think helps to put things in perspective. And it's, again, it, this isn't an opinion. Ice melts at 32 degrees, whether you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't really care. It melts just the same, whatever your opinion. And we, we're gonna look at it melting in just a minute. To put these distances in perspective, I've taken a picture of an office building and happens to be in Miami. It's a nice standalone building at 47 stories, which fits this measurement. If we are at the 30th floor with sea level today, just 20,000 years ago, which may seem like a long time ago, but when you think back biblical times again, several thousand, it's not that long ago. And our written records do go back six or 8,000 years. So it's within the realm of reason. Sea level was down at street level. That's stunning. I'm sure to you, it was, it was to me when I started to visualize that. And when all the ice sheets melt again, it won't happen this century or next, but when all the ice sheets melt again, sea level will rise the extra 17 stories, another 212 feet to the top of that building from the 30th floor. So combined, the range is 600 feet, round figures. That's astounding. But we haven't seen it because we were at the turning point 
One way I describe it is that, in effect, we've been at slack tide. You know when you're standing at an inlet that the water comes in and it kind of swirls around for 30 minutes and then starts the tide going out? Well, in effect, there's a metaphor for what sea level's been doing. It, it rose before we had cultural memory of it. It's been at the turning point, just like the tide, and it should have been going out now, starting its descent, but it's still rising because the ice sheets are melting. So let's look at why the ice sheets are melting or, or why sea level is rising. But to put it in perspective, I've got a graphic here that gives you a very crude impression of when all the ice melts. Now, it may be 300 years or it could be 3,000 years, and I'll talk to you about the variables of that. It's not going to happen soon. But there's a huge adjustment to the livable space on Earth. The red disappears. Again, it could be 3,000 years, in which case we've got plenty of time to adjust. And even 300 years is a lot of time. And, and I really do think we need to be honest about that. This isn't an, an immediate disaster. And again, sea level will affect different places in different amounts. Just looking at one meter, as scientists do, or three feet, we'll call it, the red in different places, Florida doesn't lose that much at a meter or three feet, but places in South America, the Netherlands, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, the, lose a lot more. It's, so it, it varies from place to place. To understand why sea level is rising and the ice melting and put it in perspective, I want to take you up north first. And if we go toward the North Pole, which is just open blue ocean here, we, uh, we'll get to the land of, well, one of the two places where we have icebergs. Icebergs, of course, come in all shapes and they're beautiful in their own way. Anybody who's been to uh, Alaska or, or other places where glaciers calve off probably knows how mesmerizing they are. But they're getting more prolific as things warm and they're, of course, shrinking. So they're a combination of beauty, but also a message. Because the polar ice cap has been frozen for three million years. When I dove under the polar ice cap in 1985 and did this cover magazine article for one of the diving magazines, there was essentially no concern about the ice sheets melting, the polar ice cap melting. It was still 10 feet thick ice. We had to drill holes through 10 feet of ice to dive under the polar ice cap in 1985 and 87. And it's stunning underwater. I wanted to dive there for years, and I, as I said, I did two different expeditions up there. It's clear, it's obviously extremely cold, it's uh, 29 degrees Fahrenheit, because it's, it's near freezing seawater. But when we step, step back today, most of you have probably seen some in, images of this. The polar ice cap is now clearly disappearing. It was not considered possible when I studied ancient ice ages and sea level change in 1972, it was not deemed possible for it to be gone this century. That really only began to be a consideration back in the 80s, and each decade it's gotten more and more real. The fact that it's been frozen for three million years and that the Arctic will be ice, essentially ice-free in most of our lifetimes is the best testament possible to that we're in a new era. Now, this is a photograph of the North Pole. It's a Russian submarine and one of the local inhabitants, the, uh, one of our favorite polar bears, of course. It's to point out that the North Pole is not only open ocean and floating ice, but these days it's pretty thin ice. And as ice cubes in a glass melt, they don't change the level of liquid in the glass. You know that in instinctively, if you think about it. The ice cubes are floating. They're displacing water. To raise the level of liquid in the ocean or in a glass, you have to add ice from outside or add liquid. And to see that happen, we have to go next door to Greenland, which is mostly above the Arctic Circle, but is a big island covered 90% in ice that year by year is melting more and more. This is the face of a glacier, a picture I took in 2007, showing where a glacier breaks off or calves off into icebergs. 
if you look at the farthest point in this photograph where the glacier is coming over the horizon, it's only about 500 feet tall there. But I want to take you up on top of the ice sheet. There's one big ice sheet on Greenland, and there's one or two ice sheets in Antarctica. There's, so there's lots of icebergs, thousands of them. There's a few glaciers, and there's only two or three ice sheets. These are the big flat tables of ice that really just lay flat on the island. So if we go up the glacier by helicopter, you get a pretty good sense that a glacier is a moving, bending river of ice, just as it's been described. But I think this photo gives it good visual identification for you. That's a glacier. There's about 100 of them in Greenland. And when you get on top of the ice sheet, and there's only one in Greenland, you can begin to see in the upper left kind of a sheen. That's the water melting. And it just becomes pretty obvious how it's aggregating in those vein-like structures and coalescing in bigger and bigger streams. And the streams get bigger. And for scale, that's the two helicopters in the background of our group. And you've probably seen pictures in National Geographic and elsewhere like the one on the left. The water keeps aggregating into bigger and bigger streams until it finds a crack where it can get down beneath the ice sheet or the glaciers. And when it gets down to the base of the glaciers, as shown on the right here, what happens is a lot of it does get to the ocean quicker, but more important, it lifts the glacier off the bedrock. And so whereas glaciers normally kind of grind their way slowly on the bedrock and gravel and boulders, once the water gets beneath the glacier, the glaciers move a lot faster. In fact, the speed of the glaciers has doubled or tripled in the last decade or so. And that's one reason for, that's probably the biggest reason for sea level rise increasing in the last 20 years. Now let's go to the other source of, of sea level rise. So it's not the Arctic Ocean, because that's floating sea ice. It is Greenland. And if, I should have said, if Greenland melts entirely, or when Greenland melts entirely, sea level globally would rise about 23 feet. An astounding amount. It won't happen this century. You can relax. It won't happen next century. We're getting inches from it. But Antarctica is a little bit of a different situation. Antarctica is far bigger, and it's a little confusing to describe, but I'm going I'm to have a, a go at it here with you for just a minute to break it down into three or four areas to hopefully decipher some confusion. But um, Antarctica is beautiful. There are a few expedition-style cruise ships that take people there, mostly going to the peninsula which we'll come back and look at. Of course, here are the, uh, the favorite inhabitants by the millions. There's uh, another creature, me, actually, uh, just showing you that it's not always freezing cold. I was actually, uh, I'm not tiptoeing that photograph because it's freezing. In fact, it's actually very hot. There's volcanic springs. And I was trying to find the mix between the hot volcanic water and the, the ice cold melting water. <laughs> At where I could, I could stand. And um, so just to point out, it's a very, um, very unusual environment. Here's a picture taken in 2006. Antarctica has bigger mountains than Greenland. It's a bigger island, and the ice is thicker. It's up to about three miles thick. As a result of that, being a bigger island and thicker ice, it has seven times the amount of water as Greenland. So if you multiply the 23 I gave you a minute ago, you'll realize that when Antarctica melts entirely, which certainly can't happen this century or next century in entirety, sea level rise 160 or 70 feet. That gets us to our 212 feet. If we add in the glaciers, which surprisingly are pretty small stuff, although glaciers are important to us for lots of reasons from the Sierra Nevadas of California to Peru to the Alps, and uh, glaciers that provide water and, and water for agriculture from California to China, they're really important. But all the glaciers in the world only hold enough water to raise the oceans two or three feet. That's, again, a pretty stunning fact, I think. It took me a while to, to accept that as truth. You'd think that when you look at all the glaciers in the world, again, from the Himalayas to everything else we've ever seen, pulling out Antarctica and Greenland. We're talking two or three feet of sea level rise. 
So the glaciers are not the big problem in terms of sea level rise, counterintuitively. They are proof of warming and they're going to create big problems as they disappear because of agriculture and drinking water. A glacier acts like a big storage battery for water that meters it out year after year and, and year round. And they do present a problem. But Antarctica needs to be looked at in terms of three or four components for it to make sense. Being that big white continent that we looked at a minute ago, it looks monolithic. But I suggest to you there's four places in Antarctica that you should identify. Because they'll, if you understand them, you can decode what you're hearing about uh, that may be uh, contradictory. The peninsula in the upper left, which points toward South America, is warming faster than any place on the planet. The ice is disappearing pretty quickly, but it's a pretty small part of Antarctica. East Antarctica, the right-hand part of this image, is actually getting thicker. It's growing. And until recently, it was growing fast enough that it, over, it overcame or balanced out the losses, and it meant that Antarctica, until about three years ago, was actually getting more ice mass overall. And some people have mistakenly concluded that that kind of balances out the losses from Greenland, and therefore global warming isn't a problem. And that's incorrect. East Antarctica is growing because of global warming. Say that again. East Antarctica is getting thicker because of global warming. It doesn't make sense until you this simple fact it becomes apparent that um, as the oceans are warmer, and they're about a degree and a half warmer than they've been over the last century, you get more evaporation. That makes sense. And with more evaporation, more moisture in the air, it's got to come down as rain or snow. It just depends upon the temperature. So the greater moisture that is in the vicinity of that huge ice mass comes down as snow. So East Antarctica just piles up a few more inches of snow every year. Actually, probably a few more feet. But on the left side there in red is a part of West Antarctic that's warming much faster. And not only is it warming such that um, it's not seeing the snowfall, but more ominous, a, a much greater concern, is this whole area in shaded in red there has a lot of glaciers that are draining into the ocean. Some of them go below sea level. They're actually touching seawater, which is a lot warmer than the air is. And the problem is that a couple of these glaciers pointed to in the arrow there, they were identified 35 years ago as perhaps the, the most vulnerable part of the planet in terms of global warming and sea level rise. And 35 years later, they're pretty much on schedule from what was forecast, which I describe in my book uh, in some detail if you're curious to get the details. A guy named John Mercer in 1978 said, if we keep warming at the rate we are, back in 1978 this was, he said, I think within about 50 years, these glaciers could soften up and over a decade slide into the ocean. And if those two glaciers, the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Bay Glacier, slide into the ocean, we'll get catastrophic sea level rise, which was defined as over the course of 10 or 15 years, about six feet of sea level rise. Well, that's enough to pretty much put underwater almost any coastal city in the world. It won't happen overnight. And even that catastrophic amount would happen over the course of a decade or so. But it's a stunning concept to think about. It's still considered far less than 50% probability and therefore doesn't get into any of the sea level projections. Scientists are perhaps surprisingly, perhaps understandably conservative and cautious. They don't want to scare people. And they only want to say things which they think have a high certainty of happening. Makes sense. But as a result of that, the bar or the test for saying something as what will happen with climate change or sea level rise is at the 90% factor. And so things only get into the predictions if they're at that 90% confidence level. Well, the possibility of these glaciers sliding into the ocean doesn't even approach that yet. In fact, it's not even at the 50%. Some would say it's at the 3% level. But they're warming, and I would say that it's far higher than 3%. I don't know what the percentage is. It could be 10%, it could be 30%. But it's something to keep our eyes on. Because if it continues to warm and if that percentage continues to increase, even the cautious scientists and government experts who tell us what we should prepare for will need to think about a whole new element. 
It's kind of back to this, where I started with that big block of red of what could happen suddenly. So one of them is what could happen here in West Antarctica. And then the fourth area besides the Antarctic Peninsula and East Antarctica, oh, where does work? East Antarctic Peninsula, East Antarctic, West Antarctic, is the shelves. You've, you've heard of the shelves. Here's one here. There's one here. There are several fringing areas around Antarctica. And the ice shelves are what often collapses. One of them happened on TV about six years ago. Within an hour, they can suddenly disintegrate and they fall into the ocean. They're not a lot of ice in proportion, but they're again a further indication of something that's been there for 10,000 years that suddenly is hitting a critical point and, and does give us a message that we're in, in a new era. This is the most technical and actually the only um, multi-part graph I'm gonna show you tonight. And I'm gonna just take two minutes on it because it probably has more information about climate change than anything else you could read. And as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I wanna talk you through this. It's three different charts. Sea level in blue at the bottom, blue for water. Global average temperature in red in the middle and a greenhouse gas, specifically carbon dioxide at the top. All three are lined up 420,000 years left to right, the normal reading direction. And the first thing you see is that looking at the red, let's, let's study the red for a second because that's average global temperature. The difference between an ice age 20,000 years ago and today is nine or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Nine or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, global average difference, okay? That's an accepted geologic concept, has been for 50 or 100 years. First of all, there's a natural, you can see that there's a periodic function to it, just as we saw with sea level a few minutes ago, and as we'll look at here at the bottom. The patterns between 95 and 125,000 years. That comes from a variation in solar energy that the Earth receives because of a, a cycle of the orbits around the sun, the tilt of the Earth, and um, the precession and the eccentricity are the, uh, are the technical terms. But all of those amount to a variation of a little bit less than 1% in the solar energy that the Earth receives. And it's enough to trigger an ice age, just trigger. But like many things, the trigger starts the precession of events. And what's interesting is that that 1% change in solar energy over 100,000 over 100, years is enough to put the planet back into another ice age or, or get it out. The thing you see about the four ice age cycles depicted here is that the four patterns line up from sea level at the bottom, which we looked at a few minutes ago, to now the global average temperature, to CO2, they all go in synchronization. Even when I've take, shown this to skeptics, they have trouble suggesting that that could be random chance or by accident. And in fact, it makes sense because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It traps heat, has amazing heat trapping powers. That was discovered in 1826. It's simple physics. I don't know how he did, figured it out, but Joseph Fourier figured that out with a primitive instruments that CO2 has powerful heat trapping cap, cap, capacity. So it, as CO2 and temperature change in, in tandem, the ice sheets change and that changes sea level. So that explains why the three things go up and down. But again, we see just confirmation that there's an 80,000 year decline of sea level with the slow decline of temperature and with the 20,000 year rise and that we're at the top part of all three of those cycles. And we should be going down the other way now, but we're going up. All three things are going up. Greenhouse gases, we've just reached 400 parts per million as shown there in red at the upper right. You probably saw that in the news a few weeks ago. It was not a record we should be proud of. The normal range of greenhouse gases or, or carbon dioxide is 180 to 280 parts per million. We reached 400, which is 40% higher than any time in the last five million years. And again, there's that correlation. So we see that greenhouse gases are rocketing upward almost in a straight line in this time scale of 420,000 years. That temperatures are following, the planet's a degree and a half warmer, and that the ocean's eight inches higher. The good news is, for a scientific standpoint, the things are going in synchronization just like they should. And the problem is that it's not a quick response. You can't melt the ice sheets that quick. In other words, you could, we could take a huge block of ice the size of this building and put it out in the hot sun. It's not gonna melt in one day. It doesn't matter how hot that day is. 
there's a lag time. Even if we try and cook those ice sheets at their maximum, they're not going to melt quickly, like in a year or two. Just not possible. So that's the good news. We have some time. And the truth is, I, I say that you might think tongue in cheek or I'm being silly, but the truth is we have a lot of time if we'd recognize a problem and begin to make adjustments. And that's good news. How do we know those facts? The first question I always get is, how could you possibly know carbon dioxide and temperatures more than 100 years ago when we had good instruments? Well, fortunately, nature preserved a great database. In Greenland and Antarctica, the ice cores, which are these tall tubes of ice we drill out of the, out of the ice sheets, which are laid down horizontally in layers, and so when we drill down an ice sheet, each layer is a year, just like tree rings are the, uh, the vertical growth in a tree that we drill into a tree and get, can see what happened so many years ago. But we can go in, Antar in uh, Greenland here, where this photograph was taken, we can go back 420,000 years, which is the reason for the time span of that last graph. And in each of these little bright bubbles over here, those are air samples. What happens is as snow falls, and there's a little bit of air between the space, between the, the uh, snow crystals, and as it compacts into ice and then pressurized ice, those intact bubbles actually get pressurized as the bubbles get smaller under the weight of the ice sheet. And those preserved air samples can be dated to within three years of a, of a particular year. So we can go down this column of ice and pick out a sliver, and by various sophisticated techniques say that that happened 88,312 years ago. And we can see what the percentage of carbon dioxide is in there. Temperature is a little more sophisticated because, of course, we know the temperature of the ice, so we can't learn anything from sampling that part of the air. But there's two different isotopes of oxygen. And a bit like radiocarbon dating, getting an archaeologic date on carbon items, knowing how old they are. The, the ratio of the two isotopes of oxygen tells us temperature quite accurately. So we have a sample in there of a, of a physical thermometer and the actual carbon dioxide percentage. And so the third parameter is sea level. How do we know them? Well, sea level, we can find ancient shorelines underwater. There are beaches that are very distinctive, just looks like beaches today, but now they're 100, 200, 300 feet underwater. See the pulverized sand and shells and stuff that are very distinctive going around an island. I've found many of them in my years of diving. This was in a submarine trip uh, or expedition in Hawaii just over a year ago. And the, uh, the undercut there in the lava, again, is distinctive of a wave cut. That was above the surface, and that now is at 163 feet underwater. And this pretty cool submarine was how we got around and, and found these places. But again, it's the third parameter. So we get physical beaches or shorelines. We know the percentage of carbon dioxide and the, and the temperature. So we can do those graphs. When we project that forward, and these are really from the government studies and the US Army Corps of Engineers, the projection now for sea level rise this century is somewhere between 8 inches and 6.6 .6 feet. But I don't actually think that's a good indication. Because the 8 inches, kind of shown here in red, presumes that we do something miraculous and Greenland doesn't speed up its melting anymore, which it's been doing year after year for two decades. And given the extra heat that's in the system, as you already now understand, there's no logical reason to believe that with the oceans being a degree and a half warmer, Fahrenheit, that the melting should slow down. The heat's trapped in the ocean. 90% of the extra heat we've, we've captured from greenhouse gases is stored in the ocean, like a hot rock or an outdoor swimming pool, if you will. It's a lot of mass and it traps a lot of heat. And because of that, there's no logical explanation I've ever heard that says that if we do all the right things, if we stop CO2 gases, if we drive Priuses, if we change our light bulbs and do recycling and do all the other things we'd like to think are going to make a difference, that's not going to stop sea level from rising. And even if we stopped all power plants, if we even kept greenhouse gas at 400 parts per million, the disturbing fact is sea level will still rise, just not as quick. But we'll still probably get a foot or two this century, more than the eight inches. So let's look at the range of two feet to 
to almost six feet here and say that's the range, but that doesn't allow for the catastrophic rise I talked about before from West Antarctica or methane. And methane, I wanna just spend a moment on it. Methane is something that's talked about more and more and often misunderstood. Methane comes out of the ground naturally and out of the seabed. It, per it comes out of the permafrost as permafrost warms in any of the polar regions. It comes out of the seabed because it's frozen in something called methane hydrates, which is a slushy ice that actually burns. You can actually light a match to it. And there's a huge amount of that under the seabed. And methane comes out of natural gas operations, which we're doing more and more of as an energy source. Methane is increasing. If we burn it as an alternative to coal, it's actually a cleaner energy. And that's pretty good. The problem is when methane escapes unburnt, if methane gas itself gets into the atmosphere, it'll slowly degrade into carbon dioxide over many, many decades. And over the course of a century, as it degrades into carbon dioxide, it's about 20 to 25 times stronger as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. What even most scientists haven't researched, because scientists tend to specialize, and what I did is look at all the issues of sea level rise and then wanted to translate them so that non-scientists could understand it. What most scientists don't even understand or haven't thought, just researched, is that methane in its pure form is 250 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. That by the time it's degraded over two decades, it's 72 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. Call it seven. So it's far more powerful. Now, the amount we're putting in the atmosphere, fortunately, is tiny compared to the amount of CO2 we're putting up there. But it's something to pay attention to because there are lots of sources for methane. And at those multiplier factors, whether it be 25, 72, or 256, methane is a problem. And we can't ignore it or take it for granted or just pretend that CO2 is the only problem. So that's my other... Uh, kind of sea level rise accelerator that I referred to earlier. Now the last chart that I'm gonna show you is, is a fair question of how do we do as scientists predicting sea level rise? Because you'd think that with all of our technology we'd be getting pretty good at it. And we are getting much, much better at it. But even if we look back, oh and I'm sorry, and a lot of people who doubt climate change is a problem say that scientists exaggerate to get grant money to make it seem worse than it is. So here's a graph that was published in a peer-reviewed publication, I'm gonna show it to you in three pieces, that will show you in published records, easily verified in peer-reviewed science journals, which is the kind of test of uh, accuracy. That was the prediction done in 1990 for sea level rise over the next 20 years, getting us to pretty much today. And it's shown in blue, and there's, there's actually three different components to it. There's a dark blue line, then there's a wider band, and then there's actually two faint bands here. Can you see that pretty well? The, uh, well, if you can't, the, the lower boundary is there and the upper boundary is there. And, of course, you can see the middle. And what that's saying is there's different degrees of confidence in that range. And the further out you go in time, the more the range of projections splits out, which is predictable with any, any projection. The farther out in time you go, the more variables, the more uncertainties. So the wider the range. But then in 2000, 2002, they redid it, and we're gonna show that here in green, and they did another set of projections, again looking a couple of decades out. Pretty short-term projection, should have been pretty good. And the green was just a little bit higher. We knew that the ice was melting faster, and the projection for sea level rise a little bit higher, but the bands got narrower, because we're only looking for a decade now, and that makes sense. But now we can look back and say, how did they do? Well, not too good. The, uh, the gold line is actual sea level, and the red line is a smoothed out trend line of actual sea, le sea level records from around the world. And what it shows is that the sea level projections of 1990 and 2002 were uh, low. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, the actual sea level was at or above the upper bound of the projection range. And this is not black and white, it's here in nice technicolor, but it's, it's a, a very colorful but clear illustration that just looking back one and two decades ago that the projections by the majority of the scientific community 
didn't exaggerate sea level rise. A temperature, which is the ultimate driving force here, here's a temperature graph done by the Goddard Institute of Space Flight Studies, part of NASA, which even though satellites have only been up for 30 years, they have a huge team of scientists which try and both find applications for, for satellites, but do great correlations of historical data to then bring it into conformity with what we're seeing from satellites today to try and get a better picture of what's happening in Earth. And this is their best published estimate of, of average global temperature going back to, um, was that 1880? I can't quite see that, I think so. Um, and what's interesting here again is it's an up and down line. And if somebody wants to make a case, as often happens in the press, and say, see, temperature dropped, or look at this up and down pattern, you can't get a clear picture. It's kind of like the first graph I showed you. I think if you step back across the room, you can see where that's going pretty clearly. And more interesting, or as interesting, that dip in the early 60s, that was the air pollution problem that many of us remember before the Clean Air Act was passed, when a lot of cities in North America had such industrial pollution that we had breathing problems, and uh, you couldn't even see the, the sunlight in Los Angeles and other places d d with different temperature patterns. I would conclude the entire story of this presentation and my research and my book, High Tide on Main Street, which, by the way, we'll have a few copies here for sale this evening and afterwards, and, and uh, I can sign them, certainly. But it's available as e-books. If you want to be environmental and not get a paper book, that's fine, or audio books. But the entire thesis really comes down to a single sentence. It took me a while to kind of see this. But after 6,000 years of stability for sea level and the shoreline, we're in a new era. And sea level is rising, and that means the shoreline is going to move inland. And it truly is a new era. It's different than the last 6,000 years, so that's, a, that's the big news story. It's probably the big news story of the century. Because at the end of the century, when we're all gone, but our kids, grandkids, or the next generation will be here, this place is going to look different. But the big story is that we're in a new era. Sea level should be falling, and it's rising. It's rising outside the bounds of the Ice Age cycles of the last five million years. It's going in the opposite direction. The correlation of temperature, ice sheets, and sea level is not only consistent with logic and the pattern of the last 420,000 years and beyond, but we actually have confirmation today. It's just that sea level and the ice sheets don't melt immediately, thank goodness. They melt slowly, and I, that's not a, to be a funny statement, that there's a lag time, and that means there's time to act. And I think you have to take your blessings and opportunities when they're presented, and that, that, that really is one. But the important thing is this will continue for centuries. There's enough extra heat in the ocean that even if we stop greenhouse gases at 400 parts per million, sea level or the ice sheets won't stabilize until there's been several feet of sea level rise. But we can slow it, and certainly I think we should. But then the other thing to think about, back to my opening slides of those, some of those things about Hurricane Sandy and the bar charts showing different effects, is that sea level rise provides a higher base for storm surge and when a storm hits at high tide. And what we all need to begin thinking about, because this is really far, and I was down on the Jersey Shore for the six-month anniversary of Sandy. I was actually there for the Good Morning or the Morning Joe show. And actually, Governor Christie was on the same show as I. So we, we chatted a little bit. And uh, of course, he had a wake-up call with Hurricane Sandy. But what most people there on the Jersey Shore who are still recovering, there's hundreds or thousands of houses still flattened. They haven't really thought through that a storm surge, when it happens at a high tide like happened, is particularly damaging and in that location can funnel water, which makes it even more damaging. But that sea level rise, because of what you now know, is going to slowly, decade by decade, inexorably, actually for centuries, raise the base. And it doesn't go down for at least centuries, and I think for thousands of years. But regardless, let's call it a century and take it on the low side. There's no way to refreeze the ice sheets and drop sea level within 100 years that I've ever heard of or I've ever heard anybody even suggest. 
Now, what could we do about it? I was in the Netherlands a month ago and looked at the gates of Rotterdam Harbor, which you've probably seen pictures of. Each of those gates is the size of the Eiffel Tower. Six billion dollars for this one feature to protect Rotterdam Harbor, which was the busiest port in the world. It's now given up the title to Shanghai, but certainly one of the biggest and busiest ports in the world. Really important for global trade. And the Dutch are very aware of and concerned about sea level rise because a third of their country is below sea level. Many of us remember the story about the boy with his finger in the dike. They, uh, they had their own traumatic event like Katrina, Sandy, or even September 11th when a storm one night 60 years ago, exactly, 1953, came up in two or three hours notice. They don't get the warning we get with hurricanes. And during the night, broke an earthen dike open, levee, as we call them, and 1,835 people died in the middle of the night because a whole region of the Netherlands was put underwater. And it was a result of that that a government commission was formed to say, how do we prevent this from happening again? And these are people who've been building dikes and using windmills to pump the water out for a thousand years. They had the best culture, if you will, in the world and probably the science and technology. And they came up with a plan, and one of them was these gates at Rotterdam. They had buildings. This is a town, Blessingen, where they built up a dike, and they put a road on top of it. And this newish building here with the red scaffolding, or looking like that uh, here, is even built higher. And the ground floor is like in the Florida Keys. It's a wash-through floor. There's nothing critical in the, in the bottom 15 feet. So they can allow sea level rise or storm surge to get up about 30 feet here and do no damage. So that's a great technology, and it's an example of adaptive engineering and architecture, and we need to learn from that. However, I was recently a speaker at a Miami Beach event not too far from where I live, and they touted this, said, yeah, we'll do like the Dutch do. In fact, we're going to get some of their engineers over here. We're going to protect Miami Beach like that. And I had to be the one to say um, there's a geologic problem. South Florida and the Bahamas and most coral-based islands are porous limestone. They're kind of like a solid kitchen sponge, if you want to think of them like that, made of calcium carbonate. And the water goes through those pores. And you could put a steel seawall around one of those islands, or Miami, or the state of Florida, for that matter, and the water would just percolate through the sponge or through the ground, inland. And it does that now during extreme tides and storms. You get water inland just magically appearing up out of the ground because it's porous limestone. And because we're porous limestone as opposed to clay, which the Dutch have and you have up here, uh, a simple seawall won't work. And also, it's very flat, low elevation in Florida, as you probably know. It's six feet, pretty much maximum. So we have different situations, and different places require different analysis and may allow different adaptations or solutions. Some places are not savable by our current technology, and I don't think they will be by any technology once sea level gets much higher. But many are, and the Dutch are, are pretty good at this. But even the Dutch, who've been at this for a thousand years, I gave a, a similar presentation to this over there, and they, they spent $150 million a year doing research on flooding because it's their survival. A third of the country is below sea level, historic problems of North Sea storms, of causing floods uh, from the rivers, backing up just like we get from the Missouri and Mississippi rivers inland, or you've even had here in Connecticut, I think, during one of those hurricanes uh, uh, in Massachusetts uh, a few years ago. Was it Irene? Or was it Irene that knocked out the bridges? So you've seen that, and they have that problem. But the sea level one's a new problem for them. When they, when they designed those gates in Rotterdam Harbor, they allowed for a foot of sea level rise in 1957. They didn't think it was going to get any worse than that, ever. They were designing for a one in 10,000 year storm. But when we talked about it, I was there for a full week, and they said, John, you're right, and, and we need to think about one and eventually two meters of sea level rise. And when we get past a meter, our defenses won't work. And a lot of our country will have to be um, given up by our current technology. But we'll have, we'll have decades of warning. It's just like our decision about whether to rebuild in New Orleans, which is an emotional, a cultural, and a political decision. 
And I don't have the answer for that any better than you do. I'm sure you have an opinion about whether we should have rebuilt New Orleans, which is on silty delta land that's sinking and therefore has an accelerated sea level rise and also is on Hurricane Alley and um, is an ex extreme vulnerability. And there was discussion, should we rebuild New Orleans where it was or should we in effect move it inland or up higher or do what they did in Galveston 100 years ago and build the city up 17 feet higher after the hurricane of 1900. Having thought about this for a long time and again having a, um, a young daughter and saying what's our future like and not wanting to not only be depressed but to be positive and see the glass, um, I, a bad pun, but the glass half full instead of half empty. Um, it's with sincerity I say all three of these things. We have decades of warning. This could bring out the very best in us. And if we're frustrated with our system of national or global governance, maybe this will even help. Something to think about. I conclude with two conclusions which are the opposite of what most people concerned about climate change talk about. We need to adapt to a rising sea and moving shoreline because that's going to happen. And then we should also try and slow the warming. Now, you probably normally hear it in the other order. Let's stop greenhouse gases, use solar, do all those good things, great things, and hope that we stop climate change. What I've discovered and decided as I was writing the book and now have been doing this for seven months and find that it really resonates with people, once I explain the inevitability of sea level rise, moving the shoreline inland, and even getting callous economists or property owners, very conservative people thinking about, my gosh, that, that really is a problem. Once we do that, they actually are much more interested in taking mitigation or slowing the problem more seriously because we're going to take away that valuable coastal real estate over the coming decades. And once you get their attention, instead of saying, let's try and stop it or slow it um, so we don't have to adapt, by flipping it around, it becomes actually, I'm not going to say more compelling, but I think a more compelling argument. And some of the response I've gotten over the seven months has, in, has verified that. And in final close, I take you to a picture just a couple months ago of my daughter with a friend at the beach in Florida. Um, it could be anybody's daughters or granddaughters or sons. And it's to say that besides the economic impact and the dislocation, the other motivation, which I always leave people with, is even if you tell me you're 75 or 85 years old and what can you do, why should you bother, is think of our legacy. And this is what people will think about 100 years from now. Just as with other great moral or priority questions or what were you thinking at the time, which we occasionally do in retrospect and ask people the moral or ethical question, why didn't you do anything back then? And you all know the cases where we could probably make those parallels. But I think the questions will be asked. And for the person who's very old or very callous or doesn't have kids, um, talking about whether kids, grandkids, or their nieces or nephews or whatever, or how they want to be remembered as this generation, I find it's useful. And often gets a little tear in their eyes. And if somebody's giving you a hard time about why should we bother, that's a good tactic to have. Um, sorry. For those that want more information, I've got a website, johnenglander.net. Um, there's a free special report about Sandy, six pages, ten, 10 lessons from Hurricane Sandy since my book came out before Hur Hurricane Sandy. You can download that there for free. Uh, I'm occasionally going to do some updates and I'm even looking at some possible ways to uh, get some campaigns going and some outreach similar to the, those which you're participating in and, and Doug and others here are very good at. But I'm finding that I have a wider and wider audience because of this, being on television or radio interviews and giving talks. So I'm going to look at that. And if you're interested in uh, signing up for, for mine, I don't sell my list and there's no ads. This is just simply a blog. Uh, feel free to go to my website and register. So with that, if we could uh, bring the house lights up, I'd be glad to answer questions. Thank you for your attention. My book, High Tide on Main Street, Rising Sea Level and the Coming Coastal Crisis. It's available on Amazon and on eBooks. Yeah.
Chris.